Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Please feel free to say hi in the chat and tell us where you're watching from tonight. My name is Nate Gazmer. I am Vice President and Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project for the Federal Society. This is our fourth and final movie premiere program for the new documentary, They Say It Can't Be Done. It's a great film, and we've brought together a fantastic panel tonight. RTP and Just Add Firewater are excited for a great conversation on the future of our food between the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, CEO and co-founder of Eat Just, Josh Tetrick, and co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods Market, John Mackey. Our moderator this evening is Anastasia Bowden. Anastasia is a senior attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation, where she challenges laws that restrict economic freedom and free speech. In addition to litigating, Anastasia frequently testifies before legislatures and her writings have been widely featured in many national outlets. Anastasia earned her BA from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and her law degree from Georgetown Law School. For the complete bios of Anastasia and all our speakers, you can visit our website, regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. A final note for our audience, if you have a question for the panel, please send it to us through the chat and we will ask it at the end of the program. With that, Anastasia, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I think this is the last scheduled panel on the film, but it's certainly not the least. In fact, I may be biased, but I'm partial to this panel. I hope by now you've all seen the film, and if not, I commend it to you. It is an optimistic, joyful celebration of the power of human creativity, and it's really hard to stay down when one considers our capacity to innovate our way out of emerging problems. The film is deeply important to me because it is my job to represent entrepreneurs in constitutional challenges to anti-competitive regulations. But I think the film has something for everyone. Come for the lab-grown meat, stay for the beautiful filmography. And I think the theme of having something for everyone is reflected in who we have here on the panel, entrepreneurs in the food space, and also someone from the government tasked with protecting the public. So with that, I will introduce our panelists. First, we'll hear from the Secretary of Agriculture, the Honorable Sonny Perdue. Secretary Perdue is a former farmer, U.S. Air Force captain, agribusinessman, veterinarian, state senator, and two-term governor of Georgia. In 2017, he became the 31st United States Secretary of Agriculture. And uh, with that, I suddenly feel very underaccomplished. Secretary Perdue's priorities are informed by his experience living and breathing the exhilaration of a great crop and the despair and devastation of a drought. He learned by experience what his father told him as a child. If you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. Secretary Perdue has a beautiful full biography on the Department of Agriculture's website, and I uh, recommend taking a look. Next, we'll hear from Josh Tetrick. Josh is the CEO and co-founder of Eat Just, a San Francisco-based company on a mission to build a food system where everyone eats well. Eat Just combines a world-class team of scientists and Michelin-starred chefs to create delicious, accessible, healthier, and more sustainable products. Eat Just has been recognized as one of Fast Company's most innovative companies in food and social good, entrepreneurs, 100 brilliant companies, and Time's 100 new scientific discoveries. And of course, Josh and Eat Just were featured in the film. And then we'll hear from John Mackey, co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods Market. John built Whole Foods from a single store in Austin, Texas into a Fortune 500 company, which now has more than 500 stores and 95,000 team members. A strong believer in free market principles, John co-founded the Conscious Capitalism Movement and co-authored a New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling book entitled Conscious Capitalism, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business. He's now focused on taking Whole Foods back to where it started with its emphasis on promoting healthy eating and lifestyle choices. Uh, before we get started, please remember throughout to type your questions into the question box. And at the end of our discussion, Nate's going to hop back on and read some of those questions to our panelists. With that, Secretary Purdue, I leave it to you. Well, thank oh, you, Anastasia. And good evening, all of you. Uh, are you, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. I think, uh, it looks like, it looks like secretary, we might have, we might have lost your video. I don't know if any, can everyone hmm. else see the secretary? There we go. We got you back now. Really? Uh, 
No, we're good. Well, thank you very much, and I'm glad to join you all tonight. I think uh, the fact that we are very blessed in this country and that we are essentially food independent and uh, farmers and ranchers based on their productivity, entrepreneurship and innovation produce enough food to feed ourselves domestically here and many much of the rest of the world. So I, I was thinking during the coronavirus task force, if we were dependent upon uh, foreign uh, food, uh, it would have been uh, quite dicey. Uh, some of that time. The, I think the very fact that we're able to talk about the future of food and have this conversation is because uh, we live in this uh, abundant country. Our free market economic system with a focus on innovation and not development has created great advancements in agricultural production and increased access to food. I think the world has seen tremendous economic growth and population increases because developing countries uh, have never before had such easy access to a safe and nutritious food, especially uh, animal proteins as well. And I don't think it's ever been more important to build and protect uh, on, these, uh, uh, on these issues uh, going forward. As the global population continues to grow, we'll need to build upon the advancements where if we're gonna to continue to lead the world in agricultural and food production. The, the farm is ground zero for this innovation. It's been incredibly successful over the last 75 years. And, Now's the time to build off of our innovations and expand into animal biotech and cement America as a leader in agricultural prowess uh, based in safe and affordable technology. Uh, one example, of this is how the United States agricultural output has grown significantly over the past 90 years. We've increased production of food and fiber by over 400% while accomplishing this with nearly 10% less land. Uh, this abundance of food and many choices consumers have today when they sit down at the dinner table, I think has led to a burgeoning market with lots of options. Uh, there are many countries in the world that love to have the choices that we have. Mary sends me to the grocery store and I have to call her because we got so many brands and things to choose from. I've got to FaceTime with her to find out which one she wants there when she trusts me not very often to go to the grocery store. You know, you'll find, pro you'll find products there I never heard of growing up. In fact, uh, when we did the CFAP program, the Corona Food Assistance Program, there were commodities that I didn't even know what they were. I had to look them up in Google uh, what they were. We're so uh, so diverse and so abundant there. So uh, I think new restaurants and chefs are constantly trying to find new products and cuisines in order to attract a more educated and interested consumer. Uh, I think, again, the social media, it's a social media age has amplified all these choices, it's great for the businesses who capitalize on these changes in the market. It always amuses me to see millennials uh, taking pictures of their presentation before diving in to eat and uh, putting it out on Instagram in that way. But I think all of that is really a luxury of uh, our affluence of wealth consumers to eat uh, local and, uh, organic foods. But those products, uh, I don't think will feed the world food insecurity we have in other other continents there. America spend about 6% of their disposable income on food. And when I ask our chief economist to compare that with other developed countries, uh, we learned that French consumers spend about 13% of their disposable income on food. So if you do the math, if a, um, American households spend as much as the French do on food at home, there'd be about an 830 billion dollar less to spend on other priorities. So as wealthy choose these types of food, it's important to remember there are folks who can't afford to make these choices and they have to be able to purchase foods at affordable prices. So this culture of choice has led folks to believe that in the normal conventional state because of a, a brewing marketing battle. Uh, let me ask you, I guess, uh, uh, certainly the perception is, is that organic is more nutritious and more healthy uh, than conventional foods. In the, in the past, farming started out as a noble profession to feed ourselves and our families. Now foods produced from a marketing perspective. And what can we grow that will sell the most? When uh, I like an old proverb, I don't know if it's Chinese or not, but it goes like this. When man has enough, to, not enough to eat, he has one problem. When he has enough to eat, he has many problems. And we have created many problems in society today because of the, our affluence and our choices and the reliability of our food supply. So I, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist. I'm a free economic, free market kind of guy. I believe marketing is all fine and good, but when there are statements that are not 
based on sound science, like the health benefits of non-GMO foods or that organic is better than conventional, I think we run into those kind of problems. I mean, people from all around the world are falling behind the, uh, the rhetoric that industrial agriculture is unsafe, harmful to the environment and less nutritious. But I, I simply ask, where's the evidence for that? Food in America has never been safer, yet we've never felt more unsafe. Our food is safe because of our food safety standards that lead the world really behind the USDA and the FDA. The production of organic agriculture also has its cost. Approved chemicals for organics like spraying copper are actually more harmful for the soil and more intensive than conventional agriculture. So agricultural innovation is producing more food while using less inputs, not reverting back to subsistence farming or other forms of agriculture that use more chemicals and fertilizers. I think uh, we in the industry as agriculture and food production miss the boat on the GMO labeling and marketing. The organic industry uh, has been very successful in using this as a tool to put fear in consumers that's not based on science and evidence. So no one's gotten sick that I know of or ev evidence from a GMO food. In fact, uh, I believe the opposite is true. With the advent of GMO crops, more people around the world have access to safe and affordable food and is therefore reducing malnutrition. And in fact, innovation can help us to be healthier as a society. The great thing about biotechnology is the more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn. It's unending. My vision from a biotechnology standpoint is we'll be developing food for health, really therapeutic. We'll have medicinal food. We'll have food that actually addresses the individual specific dietary needs to make us healthier, not just nutritious in a general way, but nutritious in our own general needs. And I think we need to see in the very near future, frankly, food is medicine and something that's really exciting about. So right now, consumers have never had more choices when they go to the supermarket, thanks to the innovation and success of American agriculture. And we must work to ensure that remains the case by supporting American farmers and purchasing foods grown in America and by properly communicating that our food is safe and wholesome. So. I look forward to other opinions and uh, look forward to discussions. Certainly, that's uh, one thing I've, I love about the film and about these panels is that we've had guests from a variety of perspectives and it's it's nice that we're able to uh, to hear from all sides and I suspect you'll, you'll hear some pushback from some of the other guests. Uh, so with that, Josh, uh, I, I hand it over to you. Well, I think we probably agree on a, a handful of things too. Secretary, good to be with you. John, honored to be with, with you on this panel. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about my background and explain how I got into all this. I, I was uh, raised in the South in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I thought that I was going to be a professional football player. So I thought I was going to play for the University of Alabama, uh, and then I was going to play somewhere in the NFL as a linebacker. Um, I had the chance just to play football for a bit at West Virginia. Um, realized uh, about after maybe half a practice uh, that I probably didn't have a future in the NFL because most folks were, were better than me. Uh, but I stuck it out, eventually buckled down academically, um, got into sociology, eventually went to law school um, and spent some time going back and forth living in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya and Liberia. And my work in sub-Saharan Africa was really nonprofit focused international institution focus. I spent some time with the UN uh, school where I was helping get kids off the street uh, and into school in South Africa. And I found the, um, the whole nonprofit experience in sub-Saharan Africa really frustrating. I would, uh, I'd call home, I'd tell my friends about it. They'd think I was doing something meaningful and I knew that I really wasn't. I was spending a lot of money um, on myself to feed myself, to clothe myself. And when we were looking at the metrics of how many kids were actually helping, um, the numbers just weren't there. And I was frustrated. And I um, went to the World Economic Forum for Africa, which is held every year at the Cape Town Convention Center. Uh, and that's where I saw a quote from a book that really changed how I think about things that got me here. There's a book written by a guy named C.K. Prahlad called Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Um, and the premise of the book is if you want to solve the world's biggest problems, use capitalism. And it was the first time in my life that that had that very obvious truth to me 
had had been presented to me. I had friends who, when I asked them, you know, what do you want to do with your life? They would say, the only thing you can do if you want to do something good for the world is work for the government or, or work for a nonprofit. I didn't realize that the energy and the force of capitalism in, in many ways is the most effective force for change. Uh, and I eventually moved back to, uh, to uh, the U.S. I had uh, an ex-girlfriend who let me hang out on her couch for a little bit while I figured my life out. I had a best friend who um, was there right with me when I was trying to figure out what I want to do next. Uh, his name is also Josh. And I said, Josh, you know, I feel like I should do something in business. I don't think this nonprofit thing's for me. And he said, let me tell you about the food system. Um, and he had been um, really working and reforming the food system with Humane Society of the United States for a number of years. Um, and he told me about animal agriculture. He told me about um, the significant volumes of soy and corn that we don't feed to the billion people that are going to bed hungry every single night, but instead we feed to the animals we eat. Um, he told me about some of the environmental consequences. Um, and then I thought about how it was raised and I thought about the history of heart disease that I have in my own family, the history of type two diabetes. And I started to think, well, let me take control of my own life and let me do something meaningful to make the food system a little bit better. But you need a place to start. So we decided the best place to start was to look at a tool out there in the world that's grown by farmers that is almost um, entirely underutilized. And that's the plant kingdom. So there are well over 350,000 species of plants all over the world, grown by farmers in the Midwest, grown by farmers in Africa and Asia, across Latin America. And far less than 1% of them are used to make our food better. Do we consume or use to make food products better? And I thought, what if we could use one or more of these plants that are mostly undiscovered to fundamentally change one of the world's most consumed animal protein? which turns out to be the conventional egg. So we began a process of screening through plants. We eventually found a plant that at the time I'd never heard of before called the mung bean. And it turns out the mung bean has a protein inside of it that gels at the same time and temperature as a chicken egg. And then we, we eventually launched a product called Just Egg that we're lucky uh, is on shelves at Whole Foods and, and elsewhere across the country. And then a couple of years ago, we began thinking about uh, meat, um, and we began investigating ways of identifying cells from animals, whether um, across the bridge in Marin in San Francisco or on a farm in Japan, whether beef or chicken. And we work with farmers to do that. We identify cells from these animals. We identify nutrients to feed these cells. And then we're able to ultimately manufacture meat in a clean, safe, very tasty way. And today we're, we're doing that at about a thousand liters uh, in Northern California. And I wish we were together because I'd, I'd give you a, a sample of our, our chicken breast. Um, so you could, you say so you could try it uh, yourself, but um, got a team that deeply cares about making the food system better, 150 people. Um, and, you know, this is the, the work of our lives. Um, and we, we obviously have a lot more to, a lot more to go, uh, but it's a, uh, it's an honor really here to be with you, uh, uh, secretary, um, and particularly you, John, uh, you, you've influenced me in ways that you wouldn't, uh, you probably don't even uh, realize, uh, but uh, I, I don't think I'd be here if, if not for your leadership. So really good to be here with you. Well, Josh, I'll, uh, I'll take a rain check on that chicken breast. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. John, how about you? Well, hey, thanks. That was, uh, I feel deeply moved by uh, what Josh said. So thank you, Josh. Uh, you're one of the you're one of my heroes. Your innovations are changing the world, and I think that's one of the things I want to emphasize here. That um, I'm forever being asked about the future. And here's the thing: the future is unknowable because innovations are not always predictable. We innovate in in ways that we wouldn't anticipate. So when people talk about the future, they take what they know and they draw a linear thing upwards and they can never account for innovation. And so innovation's continuing to accelerate. It's accelerating in food. And I think back in my lifetime and it's just astounding. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm sure the secretary Purdue would tell you that how the different the world is today than it was 40 or 50 years ago, it's astounding. Um, 
some of the positive things that have happened that I think about how different, like when I got Whole Foods going, there was no local agriculture around Austin, Texas back in the, in the late seventies and early eighties, it, it, it had, it had gone to a mass market system and local agriculture had ceased, largely ceased to exist. And that's completely changed. Now we see farmers markets exploding everywhere. We see local, um, local production everywhere. Small towns have, have uh, farmers markets. Craft and food artisans have just, it's incredible how many entrepreneurs are in the food space. I mean, I, I think about when I was a kid growing up and a young man, if you just wanted beer, there was, there was just, you know, there was Budweiser and Schlitz. And I remember Coors was the, the craft beer of, of when I was a young man. And, and today, every city in America has has craft artisan beer makers, and the quality of beer in America, which used to be a laughing stock around the world, is now the best in the world. There's no doubt about it. I, I, I it's just it's incredible what our craft producers are doing. Same thing with wine. Now it's the craft production of alcohol and vodka, in in bourbon, in tequila. It's it's amazing what's happening there, and then. All types of, of um, it's, it's just from, let's take plant milks. They didn't exist. When I got, we had no plant milks. Tofu was a revolution back in the late 70s and 80s in, in America. And now we've gone to plant milks, started out with soy milk. Silk made a fortune by putting soy milk on grocery shelves. But now silk is just kind of a, another product because almond milk came and took that over. Now oat milk is exploding. It's, it's just, it's a fantastic what's happening. And craft ketchup makers and salsa makers and every kind of food stuff, pickles, everything you can imagine is being, we're bringing entrepreneurship innovation to it and transforming the food supply. Um, what, what Josh has done with Just is amazing. When what's happened, what Ethan Brown has done with Beyond and what Impossible Foods is doing, bringing in plant-based products to transform and get products that taste remarkably similar. If you try, try, a, if you try a Just Egg, you know, if you did a blind taste test, you, you probably couldn't tell the difference. Same thing, I think, I, th I, I, I'm, I have to confess, I've been vegan for 17 years, so I haven't had any, any animal foods but for a long time. But I do, when I try Beyond or Impossible, to me, they taste remarkably similar to how I remember me. So it's, these are done by entrepreneurs that are fundamentally transforming the type of foods that we can eat. And I think that's positive. Josh made mention of cellular-based meats, what he's doing, but there are other companies that are doing it. I think it's going to transform the meat industry in the next 15 to 20 years because I think they're going to be able to do it cheaper and they're going to not need the same kind of land. Um, animal agriculture is, is any way you slice it. It's, it's got a heavy carbon footprint. It takes up, we, we, we mow down forest and we, and we take down the rainforest to, to plant crops that are mostly soybeans and corn to feed the livestock animals. We won't need to do that any longer with cellular based meats. So the environmental footprint's going to be a lot less. Obviously animal cruelty will be a lot less as well. On the negative side, um, the food revolution towards processed foods has been a complete health disaster. And um, the, the statistics are astounding right now. I mean, this is, I mean, the whole world is, there are some people that are going to bed hungry every night, but they're increasingly disappearing. And what's happening is the world's getting fat and America's leading the way. We are now 70% of adults in America are overweight and an astounding 42 and a half percent, almost 50% of adults in America are obese, having a BMI above 30. And that's the trend line is not slowing. I mean, it's not declining. We have not peaked. It is continuing to get worse. And as a result, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, cardiovascular diseases of all kinds, are exploding and continuing to be a very a, a huge problem in America. Um, also, the environmental impact of the meat industry cannot be underestimated. It is, it is very challenging and hence the, the, the need for us to innovate towards these cellular-based technologies. Um, 
unless America changes the way it eats and begins to eat real foods again, as Michael Pollan caught it, he caught it for the generation, eat real foods, mostly plants and not too much. And if we don't change the way we eat, then we're going to we're going to face a health crisis that we're not going to be able to easily solve. Children today are obese at very young ages. And it's not a nefarious plot of capitalism. It's the choices people are making and the food addictions that we're all struggling with. So um, I guess that'll be my opening remarks. I probably got some controversial stuff out there that'll spark some conversation. Well, thanks to you all. And uh, in thinking about your comments, I was struck about uh, what you said about craft uh, craft foods in general, but particularly craft beer, because there's another wonderful documentary that the Federal Society has done about the development of craft beer, because actually that was stalled, of course, because of Prohibition era regulations. And just a small little change allowed people to start home brewing. And then from that, it kind of grew and grew. And now we have these wonderful craft beers. And so it's sort of a wonderful story about the power of regulation to foster entrepreneurship and how the American dream <laughs> relates to American craft. So I, uh, I guess in that case, that was illegal entrepreneurship. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, as, as we point out in the film, right, you know, Uber had to sort of break in in order to, to, to get established because a lot of times there's no other way to get your foot in the door. And then once the consumers like you enough, um, it's hard, it's hard for, uh, to, to roll that back. Josh, I want to start with a question for you. In the film, we heard about Eat Just's efforts to create lab-grown meat and all of the regulatory obstacles that you faced. And in my experience representing entrepreneurs and small businesses, sometimes these regulations are well-meaning, no doubt about it. But other times the laws are efforts by incumbent businesses that are trying to shut out the competitors through regulation. Can you shed some light on the biggest obstacles that you've encountered and to what extent they're well-intentioned and to what extent they're motivated by essentially cronyism? Yeah, there's a little bit of each. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, I'll start with meat. Now, Anastasia, today you call it lab grown meat, but when it's made in facilities, 400,000 square feet, right? Clean coming off the, the, the assembly line, it's gonna be clean manufactured large scale meat, right? Uh, it won't be in a lab anymore. Uh, but today, the, the USDA and the FDA actually in the process of setting up a regulatory framework for this kind of meat. Um, and I, I want to commend the Secretary and the FDA for, for thinking through this. Um, we, don't, um, we think can be involved in this. Um, but the regulatory issues that it relates to both the meat include everything from what you call it. Um, we think it should be called meat. Secretary, I'll propose my my uh, my suggestion. Um, uh, it's complicated. Or the same thing as beef. It's made in entirely. It's made in a different way. Uh, but there's a naming issue, right? Uh, there is a um, there's a safety issue, right? The FDA and USDA you have, you have, I need to feel good about uh, other. Which is a there's a process that we're undergoing that other companies are undergoing right now to make folks feel good about the legitimacy and the credibility of the, the safety of it. But the U.S. is the only country that we're, we're looking at. Um, if the U.S. ends up taking, you know, longer than we might want, we might end up launching. Gosh. Um, yeah. I, think we're having, I think we might be having trouble hearing you. Huh. Um, that how about better. Now? Is this better? That's better. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, just, just in case someone heard a little bit, I'll, I'll keep this one short. Um, so there are any number of regulatory issues for cultured meat. Uh, one is, what do you call it? So our proposal would be what you would call it meat. Um, just because you don't need to kill an animal to make it doesn't mean it's not actually substantively meat. Uh, if you have a, a chicken allergy, Anastasia, and I give you the chicken breast, um, you're going to have an allergic outbreak, right? So it is substantively compositionally meat. So we do think it should be called meat. Uh, but that's one issue. Um, obviously, proving the safety of it's a really important thing. And I think that's an example of, of regulation done well, not, not done poorly. I think the work that the FDA and the USDA are doing right now uh, to prove out the safety, uh, particularly in terms of the process of it, um, is well-founded. And we're really supportive of that. 
Um, we're also working in other countries too, right? In terms of doing this, we're not necessarily just relying on U.S. regulators to get over the finish line. Now, in terms of uh, our, our other product, we make an egg that comes from a plant. So it doesn't come from an animal, uh, which is the assumption people made from a, a long time. That an egg needs to come from an animal. Our egg comes from a plant. And we worked hand in hand with a, with a very thoughtful FDA on the name Just Egg um, and a statement of identity that says plant-based scramble. So it gives consumers the awareness that it is from a plant. So I think that's an example of the push and pull um, that you're naturally going to have between someone like me and my company that we want to go, right? I'm, I'm very impatient. I want to I want to make this happen. Uh, and uh, and also regulators who are responsible for ensuring that it's done safely, who done, that it's done transparently. Um, and I think we've learned throughout the years that how to how to work successfully with them. But, you know, still a long way to go. Yeah, and I uh, I didn't mean you're right. Clean meat. I should pay attention. I I have no pejorative association with lab grown meat. I'm excited to try it one day. Uh, but I I I will pay closer attention. And clean meat is a is a much better way of of phrasing it. Um, well, I would say I would say not even Anastasia. Just think when we talk about lab grown meat, right? It that's only because it's a small scale right now. We used to have lab made yogurt. Right. But now, now, you you know, Whole Foods has sold tens of millions of gallons of yogurt probably a week. Right. And it's not made in the lab anymore. So I think that large scale commercial transition will happen. Right. That makes sense. Um, John, there is a healthy degree of skepticism towards capitalism nowadays and uh towards big business, I think, and popular culture. So even in litigation, I sometimes hear from the government when they're, you know, on the on the opposite side when we're uh, suing them, that they say that dog eat dog competition needs to be contained. Otherwise, it's a race to the bottom in terms of uh, wages and quality. Now, you've written a book that is essentially a defense of capitalism and an explanation of why it's moral. So can you explain that for everyone a little bit? Well, um, I can try. I did write a book, so it's not a, it's complex. But um, the first thing is, that, of course, that the metaphors we use to think about business are very unflattering. Dog, you know, we use war metaphors, we use Darwinian metaphors, and we use sports metaphors. They're almost all unflattering. They all focus on hyper competition. And whereas competition is one aspect of business, it's not the dominant aspect of business. The dominant aspect of business is creating value for other people. You create value for your customers. And you and in order to do that, you have to employ people. So you create jobs. And then you buy things from, in Whole Foods case, tens of thousands of suppliers. And you create value for them. And you're creating value for the investors. And they turn around and reinvest that capital in, the, in, in other businesses. And that helps the economy to flourish and prosper as well as benefiting the communities through taxes and through employment and through um, philanthropy. So business is fundamentally creating value for other people. Competition is one small part of it. So the dog eat dog world is fundamentally not true. It's not really what's the most important thing. Competition is an element, but not the dominant element. And it's not the lens or the framework we should see business through. F business is fundamentally good because it creates value for other people. No one's forced to trade with business. If you don't like Whole Foods Market, and plenty of people don't, right? I'm always getting attacked for a whole paycheck, this or whatever. So you don't have to shop there. You don't have to. Other people do. We do about $20 billion in sales now. So somebody likes us, but they're not forced to shop with us. And plenty of alternatives in the marketplace. And that competition, by the way, helps us get better, forces us to innovate forces us to up our game, lower our prices, get more productive. And we do the same thing for our competitors. So competition actually helps the capitalistic engine improve itself. No one has to work for Whole Foods. We do pay the best in the food retailing business and we have great benefits and we've been named one of the 100 best companies to work for for 20 consecutive years. Whole Foods is a great place to work and so we have low turnover and people work with us for decades. But nobody has to, if you don't like it, you leave. Our suppliers don't have to trade with us. If they don't like what Whole Foods does or if we're on, if they don't, they, they're not forced to trade with us. We don't have any coercion. 
Uh, nobody, uh, when we were a public company for 25 years, nobody had to buy our stock. Anybody that was unhappy could sell their stock. Again, they were voluntarily exchanging with us. It's true of all the stakeholders. Capitalism is fundamentally ethical because it's based on voluntary exchange for mutual gain. And it's not a win-lose game. It's a win-win-win game. All of these stakeholders are winning, or they wouldn't be exchanging with the business. If we just go back 200 years ago, this is, these statistics are true. You can Google it, you can find out. 94% of everyone alive on the planet Earth 200 years ago lived on less than $2 a day, 94%. That's down now below 10%, and these are inflation adjusted. The illiteracy rates were 88%. Now they're down to about 12%. And the average lifespan was 30, and now it's 72.6 across the world. That's been capitalism. That's been business. That's been innovation. Capitalism is misnamed. It should be called innovationism because it's capitalism that creates innovations that create the progress in the world. And it's lifting humanity literally out of the dirt. Actually, I'm a, I will say capitalism is the greatest invention that humanity's ever done. To me, it's not even close. It has been the engine that's driving humanity to greater and greater prosperity, greater freedom, uh, better lives for, for billions of people, longer lives, better lives. It's, it's not perfect. So you can always pick at it and criticize it because human beings aren't perfect. There are, there are unethical players in business, just like there are unethical players in, in medicine, education, certainly in government and politics. So um, business is generally judged by its worst actors, and that's unfair. It should be judged by overall what it's creating in the world. So, yeah, that's a short cap. I love capitalism, and I'll defend it till I'm no longer on the planet. Yeah, that brings to mind, I once saw um, Euron Brooks speak, and he said, charity is great. Charity has done wonderful things. Business has changed the world. And that really stuck with me, you know, and how has business done it through competing? And I always thought, just like you said, capitalism is better called innovationism, that competition, we need a new word for competition because competition implies some sort of win-lose thing when actually competition is good for everyone. And so uh, it's important to, to think about our word choices and what associations we have with them. Secretary Purdue, I was pleased to see, like I said earlier, that the film includes a variety of perspectives, not just entrepreneurs, but also the people who are tasked with protecting the public, the people who whose role it is to enforce those uh, regulations and, and to get a perspective from them too. Before you entered public service, you were a farmer and an agribusinessman, and I'm wondering how your opinion of regulation has changed, if at all, now that you're on the other side of it. Well, again, I think at USDA, our role is really just safety. It's about food safety, and our motto is to do right and feed everyone. I was unable to hear Josh's uh, response to your questions, but I, I love John's response over the definition of capitalism. That's really what we're about. Regulation has to be there uh, to balance out those evil players, maybe, that uh, may not want to play by the rules, may want to cut corners, may want to do things that are not healthy and safe. And uh, our challenge at USDA is to keep a modern technology platform because it will always trail innovation. As John was talking about innovation, we can never be ahead of innovation because we're not innovators. We are regulators in that regard, but we need to be very uh, uh, up to speed over all the kind of things, innovations that both Josh and John have talked about regarding uh, plant-based meat and other things. That's one of the reasons that we, uh, work with FDA on the cell cultured meat early on to determine uh, um, the, the protocols that would work when it'd be in the lab and when it would be uh, harvested that way in order to make sure the public uh, had access to uh, safe, healthy products to consume. So regulation is important. Obviously, uh, uh, I viewed as, a, as an entrepreneur, uh, you felt uh, typically on most regulations that, uh, that you could understand the purposes. Unfortunately, there were some that uh, I didn't understand the purpose. And I thought as a country, we were overregulated uh, in many ways and uh, in those kind of things. But for the most part, uh, I view uh, agriculture uh, in really a sustainability fashion of three. It's got to be environmentally sustainable, of course, but it also has to be 
socially sustainable for people to be able to afford it. And then it has to be, uh, as John talked about capitalism, it's got to be economically sustainable in order for people to continue to do that. So regulation should balance those aspects of that in order for the public good to continue to have food. When we talk about USDA's motto is to do right and feed everyone, that's just our motto. We're not the ones that are feeding everyone, the innovators and the producers and the creators of this uh, amazing food network that we have of so many choices are the ones that are feeding everyone. Our goal is to allow them to do that safely and uh, with modern innovation and technology. I think uh, the film takes a pretty fair perspective of regulation where it says that there is a role for regulation, just that there's uh, too much of it. And oftentimes it's going to stifle entrepreneurship. And I'm wondering what uh, you all think the role is, if any, for the government in helping to foster new businesses or innovation. Well, I'd love to respond to that. I think again in February, we announced our Ag Innovation Agenda. This week, I was on the phone with uh, uh, pr private equity investors in the, the food and ag space. We want to be conveners. We want to be, uh, again, partners with the private sector, helping to understand where they're going and what they're doing and what are these products coming along so that we can design regulation paradigms that will match what they're trying to do, again, all with the theme of, of safety and health in that regard. So we want to be, uh, we want to be a catalyst at USDA to help innovations come along, whether it's plant-based or, or, or cultured or other types of things that are coming. Uh, we were out at uh, Benson Hill uh, this past week over looking at different types of uh, genetic engineering of, of different manipulation of many of those plant-based crops that uh, Josh had talked about earlier, of how that can be uh, even medicinal type efforts for uh, for us from a health perspective. I certainly agree with John over our obesity crisis uh, in America and that uh, uh, that's what we're doing to ourselves. So I think regulation needs to have the balance there and that's what we're trying to do. Food seems to me something that's very vital to so many aspects of our life. It's vital to the way that we feel, obviously, to our health, and that translates to health care costs, um, to the land, to the environment, to jobs, the treatment of animals. And I wonder uh, if you think it's one thing that it's an area that people aren't thinking about enough. And uh, what are the biggest obstacles right now in terms of, of making food better for humanity? Um, and uh, how are we going to get there? Where do we need innovation most? Well, if that's, is that for me? You would like me to answer that? Anyone who wants to answer. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll take that a crack at it quick. I mean, I can't, I can't hear Josh I don't want to interrupt him. Is he speaking? Uh, can you, how about now? Is this any better? I can hear. This is okay. You can hear me okay. All right. I'll, uh, Secretary, I hope, I hope you can hear me. Um, sorry about that sound issue. So, you know, I think, you know, even look at, look, you know, look at the presidential debate we just had the other night. How many times was food mentioned? Not one, right? Food that is more than anything will... Um, reduce the risk of chronic disease, right? Whether you're talking about heart disease, whether you're talking about um, most forms of Alzheimer's, um, that we spend a lot of time talking about trying to put band-aids on something, right? And we spend very little time talking about very straightforward, simple things we can do to improve our own lives, right? Um, and I think that should be talked about a lot more. It should be talked a lot more in Hall of Congress. It should be talked a lot more in classrooms, certainly in medical schools, um, in families, in communities. And the responsibility that, that all of us have simply to eat better. We don't have to make it that complicated. Let's just eat better. Whole plants, as John said, pretty simple. Whole plants are good. You don't need to eat a lot of it. Um, and that goes a long way towards mitigating chronic disease, do what we need to do. Um, and, and, you know, listen, our, there are many ways to get to a healthier, safer, more sustainable food system. 
I don't think the only way is taking a cell from an animal and identifying nutrients and growing it or identifying a mung bean that scrambles like an egg. We can also create a level playing field to grow kale in the same way that we grow corn, as an example. Um, so I think there are a lot of things we can do. And I think what, what gives me a lot of hope, and I think uh, what, what John you know, was touching on and what, what the secretary mentioned is that there's such a fire of entrepreneurship happening right now. And from my perspective, the more that the, the government can not be a limiting step, that's step one. Before we even talk about anything else, let's just not limit the ability of farmers to do what we need to do. Let's create equal playing fields for someone making a, a plant-based egg or a, or a chicken egg or to grow kale uh, instead of corn. And I think we'll, we'll have taken a, a good step towards making this thing better. John, I wonder if you have a perspective on, you know, why people aren't eating better. What is the the obstacle that to that? Is it that we need more education, more public education about how food or no. is it prices? It's the way we evolved. For most of our evolutionary history, food was extremely scarce. And the Secretary Purdue made it clear that one of the great accomplishments of American agriculture was creating abundance. For most of history, food was not abundant. It was extremely scarce. So we evolved, if starvation was our issue. So we evolved to crave calorie density, which was pretty rare. You couldn't, maybe you could pull down a, uh, some gamey animal from time to time, but it's not the kind of meat that people eat, eat today. In general, we, we were up against it, getting enough calories. So we crave foods that have a lot of calories in them. It's in our DNA, we love them. And now we can have them all day long. We can eat ice cream at every meal. We can have, you know, pu pull the butter on our popcorn. We can eat candy and candy bars and uh, uh, just super rich food, lots of calories. And we love it, it tastes good. And so that's what people do. The heavy processed foods, a lot of salt, a lot of fat, a lot of sugar, refined carbohydrates. And so we become addicted to them because calorie density tastes good. And so we eat it and we get gradually get fat and fatter and fatter. It's just kind of in the DNA. So we have to become conscious enough to choose a healthy diet, re-educate our palates away from craving fats and sugars and salts. And, you know, you can do it, but you have to, you have to, you have to practice it. You have to work at it. It's not a nefarious plot by greedy capitalists. It's not a, it's just consciousness to choose foods that nourish our bodies. And each person has to make that journey because we have to overcome our food addictions. And that's not easy to do. Anastasia, combined also with a very sedentary lifestyle, our, our, our ancestors had to work much harder physically throughout their lifetime in order to feed themselves. Uh, most of us now have a very sedentary lifestyle. We're working remotely and uh, sitting most of the day. We've even developed stand-up desks so we can at least uh, stand. But that combination of that desire for a, a calorie density food with a sedentary lifestyle is a combination for obesity. Yep. Um, hopefully a Peloton and the innovation of a treadmill desks. Uh, we're, we're working towards something else. Uh, Josh, I had a question on a lighter note. I think the people want to know what happened to Ian. Oh, you're muted. Oh, there you are. Um, just tell me if you signaled me if you can't hear me, Anastasia. Um, Ian uh, thankfully ended up at a farm sanctuary um, across the bridge in the in the Marin area. So he's hanging out. He's a, he was a good sport. So we uh, we thought you know best to best to take him out of the system entirely and and give him a life on the sanctuary. So that's where you can find him today. So if if uh, is are, can people still eat Ian <laughs> the the chicken you're well, processing it, or you're producing well, from Ian? <laughs> You know, Ian, Ian was more of a more of an example, I think, of what is possible. Right. We don't need to live in a world where we have tens of billions of animals 
that are fed trillions ultimately of pounds of soy and corn that require all of this land and all of this water. We can actually say no to that world and we can choose a different world. We can choose a world in which we can eat really tasty meat. The best thing, I didn't grow up eating wagon beef in Alabama. But with cultured meat technology, okay, with, cultured meat te- with cultured meat technology, you can eat uh, wagyu beef, uh, ultimately at a large scale, at a low cost uh, in, in the long term. Um, and that's the world that we can choose, right? And it doesn't just have to be one company doing it. There are a lot of great companies out there that are doing it. And, you know, we're fired up about it. And, and Ian was, uh, we like think one of the forerunners in, in making this happen. Maybe one day there'll be a statue of Ian somewhere. I, uh, that'd, be, I thought, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was one of the most uh, impactful moments of the movie. And just, you know, not only from um, a moral perspective and it's very stirring emotionally, um, and just also the incredible innovation aspect of it and how important entrepreneurship is and how amazing, you know, things you would never even thought possible. I mean, you can imagine a hundred years ago, if they knew that you could do that, it would just seem like magic. It is magic. And uh, I think that's, it was a really poignant piece. I'll give, give, a, give a shout out to my, my filmmaker who did that to Anastasia. He, like a lot of people that work for the company, they, of course, they like that they're getting paid and they have equity, but, um, they really feel a sense of frustration uh, at our food system today. Um, and they want to use their lives to make it better. And they bring their own former creativity, whether that's in biochemistry or computational biology or process sciences or, or filmmaking to it. So it's, it's always good to see it come to life. Absolutely. Well, Nate, did we have any questions from the audience we wanted to bring in? Uh, yes, we've had a lot of questions. Certainly, there were a lot of uh, people picking up on the o- obesity uh, crisis uh, and asking, uh, are there free market solutions? Is there a role for government, specifically the USDA, to meet uh, the obesity crisis? I know we've talked about it a little bit, but I just wanted to see if there was any other discussion we want to have in that regard. Well, I would think, uh, again, John brought up a great point. This is personal choice. I think Anastasia would love to sue the USDA if we started telling them what people should or should not eat if uh, uh, based on their taste. So uh, I think, again, from a health and safety standpoint, uh, that's what we're there for. But the consumption of quantity and those kind of things, uh, obviously, I don't think that's where people want government. Very good. Any, any other comments on that? I think we've covered it. Um, I I was going to then pivot to the COVID crisis. I know the USDA has had the uh, Farmers to Families Food Box program. I don't know, uh, Mr. Secretary, if you wanted to mention anything about that uh, and its uh, recent success. I I think it surpassed over uh, 100 million uh, boxes delivered. Is that right? That's right. We just this past week, we uh, delivered 100 boxes, 100 million boxes, and uh, it was... um, I think a real a sudden awareness of all of us in that uh, over half of our food had been being consumed outside the home. And uh, when the crisis hit and all of our food service establishments shut down very, very suddenly, we had a dual alignment of uh, supply chain, food supply chain, one that served facilities like John's through retail groceries and others served the uh, food service establishments. And that business was gone. We had uh, produce being plowed under, we had milk being dumped, we had uh, animals potentially euthanized that way. So we had to pivot very quickly. And uh, we, our folks at USDA came up with this process that uh, would contract with the distribution system in the middle. They would contract then with the producers. And then we would use the charitable organizations of this country to deliver the food for to people in need that may have never found themselves in that situation before. So. I looked at it as a win, win, win. We've been all over the country. It's been widely acclaimed and uh, people having access, John, to maybe vegetables they haven't been exposed to since a child. So maybe we have helped to educate some people about uh, how to eat differently in that regard uh, uh, going forward with the, with the Farmers to Family school, Food Box. But I think it's been a real trifecta win and we're uh, we were honored to be a part of that. 
Very good. And Josh, uh, uh, do you have a, I might have missed it in the conversation, but do you have a, uh, an idea of where cell cultured meats will be available in terms of globally uh, first or uh, green, green lit by yeah. government? Uh, well, uh, Secretary, we, we'd love cultured meat to, to be available first here. Um, we, we just got to get it, got to get that regulatory framework over the finish line uh, that I, that I know you and the FDA are taking leadership in, but that's certainly our preference, right? I would like nothing better to serve it at a dinery. I used to go at in, in Birmingham, Alabama is the, is the first place that we, uh, we put down our chicken. Um, if it's not here, I think it'll likely be, uh, it'll likely to be one country in Asia. Uh, but we, you know, we need to sort out the naming and obviously need to ensure that we uh, have a uh, robust package so everyone feels confident and, and safe about the product. Um, I'll just say, I'll say a note on COVID. Obviously, it's not lost on anyone that we're not next to each other, right, or we're on this call. Um, and I saw Kim, Kim, I don't know what your last name is, but Kim says, uh, listen to this talk. It seems like you guys think all is hunky-dory. So I, I want to say something to Kim. Because uh, I certainly, uh, and I know every, everyone here doesn't think it's hunky-dory, um, that, you know, COVID is a zoonotic disease. And we don't call COVID a zoonotic disease enough. And then when you break down the abstraction of what it means when we say it's a zoonotic disease, it just means that disease is jumping from an animal to a human. And that doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of actions that we decide to take. Uh, whether those actions are large-scale deforestation, whether those actions are encroaching on um, other habitats of animals, whether those actions end up being the way that global intensive animal agriculture ends up playing itself out. And we can take different actions. Right? We can take actions that significantly de-risk our food system. Um, and just like the health issues, we don't always have to deal with everything as it's an emergency, right? Um, a stent is a perfect example of dealing with a thing on the back end, right, instead of the front end. Um, and we, look, we can look at zoonotic diseases in the same way. And the answer to the, both of those things from my perspective um, is the very simple, straightforward, responsible thing of putting healing things in your body instead of things that are harming you. Um, and that's, that more than anything, that, that's my wish and, and that's what I wanna fight for. John, uh, pivoting to you, just uh, questions about uh, how your company has uh, met the COVID challenge and what you've seen in, in terms of innovating the way uh, the market uh, interacts with the public. I know you told me any, any sort of new investments at the company are top secret going forward, but uh, reflections on how your uh, store has met the crisis. Well, um, let's start out by saying 2020 has been the worst year of my life. And uh, it's been a terrible year for, for America. It's been over 200, 200 over 200,000, 205,000 people now have lost their lives from COVID. We've seen tens of millions of people's economic lives ruined through economic lockdown. Um, it's been a disaster and uh, we can't get post COVID soon enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, in terms of Whole Foods, we put safety first. Um, we've, we've been repeatedly named as the safest grocery store in America during the COVID crisis. We were the, one of the first to do temperature checks, put mandate masks for our team members, uh, disinfect our carts and our equipment that comes into contact, as well as having our customers also wear masks. So we've been very safety conscious. But social distancing, it's been difficult because we're humans, we're social, we're social beings, we're social animals. We need, we need to connect with each other. And I can tell you Whole Foods is a very huggy culture and people you know, nobody's hugged each other as far as I know for many months in our stores. And uh, you're always talking in masks and it's it's very, very unpleasant and difficult. I always think the company's made a lot of goodwill deposits in our team members for, for decades. And uh, we're making withdrawals now. And that's unfortunate. It's hard. 
it's very hard for the team members and we've done all we can to keep people safe, but these are hard times and uh, it's challenging for everybody. And I'm just really want to get past this and begin to return to normal. So. Very good. Uh, Secretary Perdue, uh, question for you. What are, uh, I guess, the changes you're most proud of uh, since you've been secretary over at USDA and the things you're looking forward to accomplish uh, at the department going forward? Well, again, when we began, uh, we talked about becoming uh, the most effective, the most efficient, and the most customer focused agency in the federal government. I think we worked on changing the culture to do that, including. We, we, we view our consumers as customers. We view our producers as consumers. Everyone in that food supply chain that we learned a lot more about this year about uh, how efficient and how effective it is, but also how fragile it is based on these kind of things. So uh, that's what we're trying to do is to reach out and to figure out how we can fulfill that motto of doing right and feeding everyone in the most effective and efficient way possible. That's what, uh, what we've done. We've got a good group of people there uh, mostly, uh, uh, frankly, pretty much apolitical in a lar large sense that just want to uh, do right in helping people have uh, good nutrition. Anastasia, do you have uh, further questions you'd like to ask the panel? The only thing I was going to ask uh, was if there's any particular innovations anyone wanted to mention coming up. You know, Josh, anything at your company going on or anything uh, from the secretary or anything at Whole Foods, anything that uh, you're excited to tell people about because it's uh, interesting and inspiring. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll tell you one thing. So um, and again, just note to me, if you, you can't hear me, I'll speak up louder. Um, so every, every year we come out with um, an improved egg. Um, and the thing about plant technology is it's only on day one. So there's a lot of room to improve. Um, we want to improve the taste and the texture and ultimately the cost. And ultimately we want to get to a place where we have the most cost effective egg on the planet. The average cost of an egg globally is about 8.2 cents. So we want to be significantly below that cost. And we want to taste in a blind taste test um, we want 75% of people to prefer it to a pasteurized egg. Um, and we're launching uh, version three. Um, one of the first places that it'll, it'll land uh, will be a whole food market before the, before the end of the year. And it's just the, the continued um, really good work of uh, a group of people at my company that are, that are pushing hard and, and trying, to, trying to make the food system better uh, in their own way. So I'm, I'm proud to share that. It's exciting to me that we all have, uh, you know, different roles, different places, and I think uh, we agree on more than we disagree about. So uh, it's a pleasant way to end this conversation. Well, before we do, I did want to ask, uh, since we have the benefit of uh, John Mack on the line, he's, I know he's got a new book uh, uh, that uh, just came out in September. And it talks about how uh, humanity can be elevated through business. I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about uh, that book, John. Yeah, I'd love to. It's called Conscious Leadership, Elevating Humanity Through Business. And we need conscious leaders. Conscious leaders are leaders that put purpose first. They lead with love. They have integrity in all things. They, they look for win-win-win solutions. They think long-term. They innovate and create value. They're constantly evolving their team. They are continuously learning and growing their entire lives. And to be a conscious leader is not easy because it requires a lot of inner work. Love is a skill. It's not just an emotion and we can get better at it, but we have to practice it. We do not think win, win, win. Most people think win, lose. If somebody's getting rich, somebody else is getting poor. If someone else is succeeding, someone else is failing. There's good and there's evil. There's light and darkness. It's a very binary worldview and it's not very accurate. In fact, we need to replace that with a win-win-win ethical system where, where everybody's winning. We're taking, uh, we're taking everybody in America with us. We're becoming more affluent. We're, we're becoming more equal. We're, we're making great progress. And uh, we need conscious leaders in business, but we also need them in politics. We need them in government. We need them in education. We need them in healthcare. 
We need them in the military. And if you think about it right now, I mean, don't you, isn't it obvious that we need more conscious leaders? <laughs> I mean, it's just so obvious to me. I just, I look out and I just see we're squabbling with each other. We're tribalized. We're, we're calling each other's names. We're bullying. We hate each other. It's just, uh, it's not very conscious at all. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's <laughs> so the book in some ways is very timely. I'm very proud of it. Uh, it's, it's really a sequel to conscious capitalism. You can't create a conscious capitalist society and you can't create conscious businesses. If you don't have conscious leaders, you can't have conscious leaders unless people are willing to do the inner work to develop themselves into conscious leaders. And so the book's full of practices and I'm um, very proud of it. I hope some people will buy it and read it. I think it'll probably change the way you think about things if you do. Very good. John, John, you mind if I, John, you mind if I ask you sure. a question? Um, I have it. It's, it's, uh, it's on my next book to, mm -hmm to read list uh, on my Kindle. Um, I, so I, I haven't, I haven't read it yet, but in terms of the, you mentioned inner work a, a few times and how this is, it's about work. It doesn't just, it's not just going to come to you. Are there one or two um, examples of that kind of inner work that have been the most relevant for your life? Well, they're all relevant because there are a lot of well, almost every practice that's in the book or practices yeah. that I've done or do. Uh, but let's just take chapter two, which is lead with love, which I think is one of the most important chapters, because love is something that is not common in our corporations. Because, again, they have this hyper competitive war. It's all about winning competition type metaphors. And so love is seen as weakness. So we check it at the door and we create work environments that are not very caring. We don't bring our full whole selves to the workplace. And I'm not talking about romantic love or sexual love. I'm talking about the, the love that we have for our fellow human beings. So yeah, some of the, and the way to understand love is to understand that it's a set of skills and we develop those skills in things like um, generosity. You can practice generosity. You start small and what you find is that it feels good to be generous. And so it feels good because that's a win-win. You're helping others and they appreciate it. And so you, as you develop generosity, you get more skilled at it. Or gratitude is another one that um, is easy to practice. In fact, if you want to be happy in life, start with gratitude. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I do a gratitude practice. It is amazing to be alive. We, we're not here that long. Life is short. Life is, it, the world is incredibly beautiful. We get to move, touch, feel, see, hear, love, learn, grow. It's incredibly beautiful. They're amazing people. Yeah, gratitude. Practice that every day and watch how it transforms your life. I'll, I'll do one thing on appreciations. This is something Whole Foods does. We end every meeting we do at Whole Foods with appreciations. They're voluntary. Nobody has to do them. But when you're appreciating someone authentically, you cannot do that without opening your heart. So the act of appreciating actually releases love in your team and your group. And then of course, if you've received an authentic appreciation for somebody, it's really hard to stay kind of judgmental of that person and angry. You start to reevaluate them. You know, maybe I misjudged Josh. He's really quite a nice guy. He's really uh, thoughtful and kind. And uh, I think I want to be friends with him. So appreciations can completely transform your organization if you practice them. And we practice them in Whole Foods and it's part of our secret as an organization. But there's also care and compassion and most importantly, forgiveness. We need to practice forgiveness because we nurture all these petty grievances in our heart and all these little judgments that keep us from being able to forgive. And so we we trap ourselves in our own sort of poisonous world of anger and pettiness and grievances. And hey, I see it right now. We need forgiveness big time in America because there's so much anger. It's just incredible how angry people are and how they're yelling and screaming at everybody in righteous indignation. That is, you're not happy when you're doing that. You will, that's not love. And forgiveness can release all that if we'll practice it. And we have forgiveness practices. So that's just one chapter, but I promise you every chapter has got a number of practices that we can do. And 
you will become more skilled if you'll do the practices. In other words, you know, Malcolm Gladwell says that, I think that's Malcolm Gladwell that said, if you want to master something, you have to give about 10,000 hours to it. Okay, yeah. I'm saying that for conscious leadership. If you want to be a conscious leader, you're going to have to give about 10,000 hours to it because you're not going to read a book. And it's not just ideas. You have to change your inner being and you will do that if you will do the work. And we need leaders that were willing to do that work. We need conscious leaders in America. It's how we're going to get to the other side, gang. We're going to have to find the higher ground that unites America. If we don't do it, we're going to tear ourselves apart. We have to go back into love. We have to find win-win-win solutions. And we need people to stand up and do it. We need conscious leaders who have the courage to do these things. That's why we wrote the book. Very good. Well, we are coming up on a hard stop. Uh, but I, I do want to say what an honor it is to have all of you and especially uh, Secretary Purdue to have you with us. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to give you the last word if you'd like to uh, finish us off with anything. No, I think John just gave us a great sermon and I, uh, I <laughs> and that's uh, that's the way I do that. But I talked about forgiveness and compassion and gratitude and all those things. I think uh, I read a book a long time ago about those things and uh it, it was written a long time ago. So uh, I, I love to hear that. And I think we would be a better society if we all did that and practice it. You can't read about it and not practice it and get it done. So uh, thank you, John. I look forward to reading your book. Thank you, Secretary Purdue. I'd be a great honor if you read it. <laughs> well, well, thank you all, Secretary Purdue, Anastasia, Josh, John. Uh, to our audience, we welcome your feedback on tonight's program by email at rtp at redproject.org. A final note that the free link you received to the film is good through this weekend. So if you haven't watched it or think someone else should watch it, please send it along. You've just got a couple more days. And again, thanks to all. Have a great night. Thanks, Secretary. Bye, everybody.